Welcome everyone. Welcome to folks who are just joining us. Uh, good afternoon uh, and good morning to some if you're calling in from the West Coast. Um, I uh, welcome to this live online discussion organized by CUNY Based Research Canada. Um, I am so uh, delighted to, to be here with all of you today. Um, my name is uh, Sarah Switzer. I'm, I'm the, the program coordinator at CUNY Based uh, Research Canada. And today um, I have the esteemed pleasure of being able to introduce our guest speakers for today, Dr. Zach Marshall and Veronica Benz from McGill University. Um, feel very, very kind of grateful to be able to share uh, this stage um, with them. So before we begin, um, I'd like to start by inviting us to reflect on, on the lands that we're on. Uh, the CBR Canada Secretariat uh, is situated on the traditional territories of the Neutral, Anishinaabe, and Haudenosaunee peoples. Uh, many of you may also be calling in from different locations. Um, and so I invite you all to kind of uh, introduce yourselves and chat, uh, including where you are calling in from or where your feet might be planted, including the territories that you're on or in relationship with in terms of treaty agreements and responsibilities. Um, when in chat, you might just have to toggle to the everyone uh, function instead of the uh, panelists and hosts for us to all see you. Uh, but please, please, please um, join in on the conversation. In the spirit of reconciliation, CBR Canada is committed to engaging with and learning from diverse Indigenous peoples and communities across Canada, as well as addressing the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action. Last year, as part of our series, we began each webinar by highlighting one of the calls to action. Continuing um, with this year and continuing to, to do so, we want to start by highlighting action number seven. We call upon the federal government to develop with Aboriginal groups a joint strategy to eliminate educational and employment gaps between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Canadians. And in today's session, we'll really learn here about SHIFT, Working for Change and Participatory Research, which is a national community-based research project focused on labor practices and participatory research with a sub-focus on COVID-19. And I personally look forward to thinking about the ways in which we can better our labor practices and participatory research while also keeping this call to action number seven in the front of mind. Um, and I hope that we can continue these conversations next week in our live discussion and more on that soon. So for those of you um, who have never been to a Community-Based Research Canada event, welcome, 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 welcome. A little bit about Community-Based Research. Um, our mission is to advance community-based research excellence in Canada by strengthening partnerships, building capacity, mobilizing knowledge, and championing community-based research amongst individuals, communities, and institutions. For 10 years, Community-Based Research Canada has brought together key players of community campus partnerships and research across the country. Um, and for those of you who are unfamiliar, we're a nonprofit social enterprise funded entirely by its members um, and really try to be a kind of a home for community campus researchers um, working across community and academic settings who conduct uh, participatory research for social change. Uh, and this event today is part of a, um, an e-learning series that we have been hosting this year on community-based research and COVID-19 with a focus not just on widening inequities, but also really amplifying um, community-based visions for change. Uh, so as part of our programs, we host a number of live events like today. Um, and uh, if you have any questions at all, we ask you to put them in the, the chat uh, throughout our series uh, or throughout our, our session today, really. Uh, and we'll attend to some of the questions at the very end. Uh, and uh, we will uh, we'll ensure at the end to tell you a little bit about our event next week on November 18th, where we will continue the conversation. So today we'll mo be mostly hearing from our presenters and we're so fortunate to have them here with us. And next week, we really open the dialogue to all of you so we can really um, take some time to, to dive deep into, into the discussions that uh, uh, both uh, Dr. Zach Marshall and Veronica Benz will be sharing with us today. Okay, so um, let's get started. I have the very esteemed pleasure of introducing our panelists. Uh, Zach Marshall is a community-based researcher and assistant professor in the School of Social Work at McGill University. 
Building on a history of community work in the areas of HIV, harm reduction, and mental health, Zach's research explores uh, interdisciplinary connections between public health, um, or excuse me, public engagement, knowledge production, and research ethics. His current focus is, is SHIFT, Working for Change and Participatory Research, a project exploring labor practices and participatory research across the social sciences, natural sciences, and health in Canada which we'll be talking about today. And alongside Zach is Veronica Benz, um, who's a clinical social worker presently working in community mental health in Calgary, Alberta. Veronica has long been concerned about issues of access and uh, oppression in health, arts, and academia, and her career continues to span both academic and nonprofit sectors. And Veronica is thrilled to be serving as the research coordinator for SHIFT and has been in involved in the project since early 2020. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen momentarily because we're going to do a bit of a screen switch off. So just bear with us. And I'm going to pass it off to Zach and Veronica. Zach and Veronica, I'm going to spotlight both of you so we can see your friendly faces. Wonderful. A moment, I'll also bring Veronica up. Okay. We get to start, Sarah? We're fabulous to start. Take us away, please. Okay, Thank great. Thank you so much. I know I've been really looking forward to today and connecting with this wonderful group of people who is, uh, who are really have a lot of experience in community-based research, The really the people that we want to talk to. So today, um, we are going to introduce you to SHIFT and some of our early uh, data analysis. I want to mention from the start that this is really brand new. We did two waves of data collection this year, and so this is the first time that we're presenting any of this uh, in public. So I put that out there to you as it's extra exciting. Just to give you a little bit of background about SHIFT, this is a picture of many of the people from our co-investigator and collaborator team from a planning meeting we had when we were trying to get some funds for the first phase of the project. And at its core, SHIFT is a project that's focused on building solidarity and improving labor practices in participatory research. And you may recognize some folks from this photo. I hope you do. And along the bottom, we have some of the logos, the logos of the institutions involved. And we also have some of our partner agencies, including folks from uh, PAN, the Pacific AIDS Network, and CAN, the um, Canadian Aboriginal AIDS Network. So you might be wondering about this term participatory research. So I want to make sure to make it clear what we mean by that. We were trying to find a term that would work beyond only CBR, because we're trying to engage with people that do that engage, here we go, participatory forms of research include members of the public or other key stakeholders in research beyond roles as participants. So it's really broad. It could include clinicians, policymakers, patients, um, obviously community members and other non-academic partners. So I feel like with my CBPR um, mindset, I, I need to broaden it a little further in thinking about participatory research because it may be more than what we're typically looking for or we're used to seeing. Um, so the terms used to describe these type of methods obviously would be things like CBR, CBPR, Indigenous CBR, but also words that might be less familiar to some folks here, things like citizen science, um, patient-oriented research, or PAR, which I think you will be very familiar with. So we were trying to look at engagement of stakeholders um, in research beyond just the community-based research lens. So in this presentation, when you hear participatory research, you'll know that's what we're talking about. And we tend to use the, the term community stakeholder when we're looking for a word to describe who we mean. Although, as you'll see, the language really varies uh, depending on who's who we're speaking with. So when we first started SHIFT, um, we got a grant from the SHRC, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Fund Insight Development Grant. And we had a number of lofty goals. 
Um, and so the main ones we want to talk to you about today are our attempts to develop a typology of participatory employment roles and to describe human resources practices and policies with community stakeholders. So we were, we, we thought, okay, the way we're gonna do this is we're gonna do a mixed methods project um, where we would do a survey with uh, principal investigators, um, academic researchers, and then we would do some follow-up interviews to get more details, but we wanted to get a broad look at what was happening in terms of participatory research practices in Canada. Um, so we were like, okay, we know what we want to do. We're going to do a survey. Great. Okay. Oh, where are we sending this survey? <laughs> so that was our next challenge. And you're going to see here, there's a number of sort of challenges that we faced as we were trying to figure this project out. So we all of a sudden were like, huh, oh, do we just want to do like a snowball sample in terms of circulating a survey or a link to a survey? How else can we do this? Um, so we, we kept brainstorming, okay, well, we, we could see who's been, maybe we could look at who's, who's published, we can go to certain journals, is that the way to do it? Oh, should we do a search for like community reports or should we go through websites in order to find community based and other participatory researchers in Canada? Um, how the heck do we do this? Because it's not like there's a centralized list. So then we thought, okay, maybe how we can start this is we could go to the people who have been funded in Canada um, through the tri agencies. So we said, first, what we'll do is an environmental scan of who's been funded, um, what type of research have they done, and then we would be able to send those folks a survey and then do the interview. So we knew all of a sudden we had this huge step um in front of us <laughs> so what we did is we asked um the tri agencies so that's the canadian institutes of health research the natural sciences and engineering research council and the social sciences and humanities research council to uh, give us information about who they had funded from 2013 to 2018 um, and as you can imagine that was a pretty big uh list and Veronica is going to talk more about that momentarily, but we that information is publicly available because those are uh, publicly funded projects and um, most of the details they'll give you are things like uh, who was funded what's their affiliation, a summary of the project, the terms in terms of like the funding dates, um, the amount and the general subject areas, so we were able to get all of that information from the tri agencies. Um, I'm just trying to think, is there anything else? I'm going to, I'm going to pass it to Veronica, who's going to take us through the next piece. Sounds good. Um, so yeah, the first step was really to obtain the data um, for projects funded. And it's important to say that the, the information that we got was really at the project level. So um, we got a description and the information that Zach mentioned. And then we had to look at it. So on the next slide, you'll see what it looked like when we pulled in that information into our database. So here we were with thousands, we'll get to the, the volume in a second, of project descriptions. And then we said, okay, well, we have to, to go through this to sort of filter it, to code it, to see what we wanna do. So um, we looked at every project description. It was looked at twice by two of our uh, research associates. And we applied coding based on if we thought it was participatory research or not. Um, on the next slide, you'll sort of get a sense of the, the amounts that we're talking about. So, uh, so initially we received well over 40,000 project descriptions from the tri agency. Um, we ended up, with the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council, we ended up um, scanning 10% of it. Uh, but otherwise, we looked at every single one from CIHR, every single one from SHRC, uh, twice. <laughs> so it was a huge endeavor um, for our uh, you know, research team, but we felt it was really important to look at every single one. Um, 
so you can see on the sort of next level that after we had screened all the records and tried to identify participatory projects based on key terms, based on interpretation of the description, based on meeting uh, within the research team to reconcile uh, if we had different, you know, if we had done different coding or if we needed to discuss trends. Um, so we ended up with a sample of projects that we had included based on our criteria that we thought were participatory. And we also identified a random sample um, from each of the tri-agency funding bodies. The next step was to try to figure out how to contact them because we did not receive contact information from the uh, tri-agency, although it was we could sort of tell who people were. Um, so we obtained 5,480 email addresses. Um, and then we sent out the survey to, the, to that number of people. Um, if we move ahead, we can sort of get a sense of what we tried to do with the survey. So it's important to say um, that the survey questions related to a specific project. So you can imagine that, uh, you know, an individual a researcher would probably have many projects that might meet our, our inclusion criteria or might be in the pot for the random sample. Um, but we decided we only wanted to send each investigator one survey. Um, and so if there were more than one grant that, that would have been in our group, uh, we made sure to select the older project with hopes that it was more underway or possibly completed and that the, the investigator would have more to say about it. Um, one thing about our recruitment was that we made sure to do it uh, bilingually in English and French. Um, so every participant would be able to access the survey and the communication in either English or French uh, in both of them, but we reached out to them initially based on the language that they had submitted their application to the tri-agency in. So if their application was in French, we reached out to them in French, but they would have easily accessed the English uh, content. We used the Dillman um, tailored design method to inform how we created the survey, how we engaged people. Um, you know, this method focuses a lot on, yeah, like communicating respect and, um, and acknowledging the input of the survey participants uh, to really sort of minimize their work, minimize their cognitive load, minimize their confusion to really make it easy for them to respond to the questions that we had. Um, we used the tailored design method as much as we could. There are certain things about incentives and compensation that we weren't really able to do within the scope of our project, but we, we really uh, did our best to, to use every part of it that we could and to, and to let it inform not only the survey, but our communication about the survey. Um, Something that's really important to say is that the survey was not anonymous. Uh, we reached out to specific people for specific reasons. And um, one of the things that's really exciting about that is that our survey results are eventually are going to be able to link to that publicly available data from the tri-agency, which, uh, you know, kind of sets us up to be able to think about trends in small universities versus big universities or you know, provincially or rural versus urban. So we're, we're really excited about, uh, about getting to that phase of, of sort of understanding what we can garner from this huge data set that we have now. Um, so, okay, the survey, what did we ask this, these people? Um, the, this is like a bird's eye view of, of sort of what we decided was really important to ask. The first thing was this project that we reached out to you about was it participatory or not? Like, how would you describe this work? Um, something we're really, really glad that we did uh, because we were reaching out on a project level, not asking about a researcher's body of research. We said, so is this specific project participatory? And if not, is there another project in your repertoire that you would like to discuss with us? And um, actually 11% of respondents talked to us about a project that way. So. We reached out to them about a project that was not participatory, but they had something else in their body of work that they wanted to talk to us about. So we're really, really glad that we asked that question. Um, other things we wanted to know, who is involved? So who are your community stakeholders? Um, you know, what language are you, are you using uh, to, to describe 
to describe your community stakeholders, to engage with them, to report on them, you know, sort of what terminology is important to you, uh, the types and frequencies of the different participatory research roles. So, so what's the scope? Are people involved once? Are people involved every day over several years? You know, what's the middle range? What's, what's really happening? Um, yeah, what are the types of working relationships? So here is the, the sort of labor engagement part of SHIFT. So we want to know how, how are people compensated? How are they involved? How are they thought of? Uh, sort of within a labor structure of the project. Of course, it was an opportune moment to ask about the impact of COVID-19 that wasn't on the radar when the project started, but by the time we were designing the survey, we realized that this was a, a great opportunity to ask about how COVID-19 was impacting participatory research in Canada specifically. Uh, and we also had an opportunity to collect some, uh, you know, we, we didn't go too, too granular in terms of researcher demographics, but I think we collected some important information that, uh, that again, when we link back to that, that larger data set from the tri-agency, um, I think we're brimming with the possibilities of, of understanding more about, about who's conducting what kind of participatory research in Canada. We can move on. Okay, so what did we find? <laughs> um, this is where it gets pretty exciting. Um, so first, our response rates. So uh, we're pretty excited. We're pretty excited by these numbers. Um, to be honest, these this is the preliminary level of engagement. So what we're reporting on here is the very first question that was asked, which was consent to participate in the survey. That was our primary level of engagement, uh, and you can see it here based on the whole. We had thirty two point seven percent of the over five thousand people who we wrote to respond at least at that level. Uh, and you can see it broken down by the different tri-agency bodies as well. Our next question um, that, that we really wanted to, to show to you is, okay, so who was doing participatory research? Because we reached out to people based on their project description or based on them being included in a ran random sample. So initially, of that first question, was this project participatory or not? Uh, over 50% of people said it was participatory, but that's not the whole story because for the people who said no, we did ask them, oh, is there another project that you wanna talk about? And so of the people who said no, 13.5% said, actually, yeah, I do have participatory research that I can talk to you about. Um, so that was over a thousand uh, respondents who said, yeah, I've got a participatory research project that I wanna talk to you about. So. That's kind of our sample of participatory investigators. So, okay, then who was it? Who was involved? Who are your community stakeholders? So this gives you a sense of, of what was reported. Um, there, you know, there's a, a big diversity here that we're interested in exploring. You can see from the numbers that um, it adds up to a lot more than just over a thousand. So people were obvious, there are obviously certain projects that are involving you know, different types of stakeholders. So that's really interesting to us. Um, and here, the language question that um, became more and more interesting as we went along. And you can see here that there's also with, within individual projects, there's a different language flo floating around. So, so that's telling us something about how we're talking about this in Canada. Okay, so what were they doing? What are the community stakeholders doing in the project? So everything from community members to study design, um, you, can see, you can see the different roles that people are participating in. And yeah, it looks like people are, are involved in several roles. Community stakeholders seem to be involved in more than one role in projects just by the number of people who are, are saying, yeah, I've got of the thousand projects, uh, people are involved in this many different roles. So. It's good to know. Different types of data collection uh, done by community stakeholders. So, so you can see here that, that even within data collection, there's a huge diversity in what people are doing. And yeah, again, likely they're doing more than one thing. Data analysis. So, so who's looking at the data? You know, who's, who's helping us understand what it is? 
Um, and yeah, community stakeholders have a lot of different roles within this as well. Is it helpful, Veronica, if I go back one, Derek? Do you mind if I go back? Please one, do. Just for a minute, because I'm sort of, I was really intrigued by some of the data here on the roles. Um, because we were sort of, a, a lot of times in CBR, CBPR, we, we, we talk about the continuum of the research process and where people get involved. Um, and so we have anywhere from committees and actually pre-planning was in, identified in the other category, which by the way, we, we're not able to share with you today all of the, um, a summary of the other responses, but I think it's gonna be really interesting because this was just, our take on what people would potentially select, but there was so many other um, pieces that they started to put down. And I'll tell you more about that in a minute. So, so definitely we have, this is not ranked uh, by frequency, but more by stages of the research process. So obviously you're seeing a lot of involvement at knowledge mobilization, which we would expect, but I was also surprised that some of the other like high numbers still on um, around design and, and data collection. And then if we look at data collection, um, you know, I know sometimes we have critiques um, and we talk about the problem of only engaging people at recruitment, but here we also see such a range um, of, of levels of involvement, even including um, collecting observational data, interviews and focus groups, surveys, which we would probably expect. But then this other data collection roles is so helpful because it, it gets us out of our mindset of what we know to thinking about different types of projects. There's one that said, you know, um, counting fish, you know what I mean? Like there's things that were really, really detail oriented and I'm excited to be able to get into that piece about the other roles. Cause then I think we could build potentially a better survey for the future that uh, reflects the broad diversity of, of participatory research roles. And similarly, when we're talking about um, data analysis, I was really intrigued, <laughs> to be honest. I was thinking, oh, transcribing interviews. Well, I, I was surprised because that's not in, that's not something a lot of people necessarily want to do as a way of engaging, but definitely um, coding, I think we see more and more. But I was also surprised at the high numbers on the statistical analysis piece. So this will be something that we'll have more information on as we're able to get into the uh, analysis of the text fields, which was in the other piece. So, um, sorry, Veronica, I just wanted to, to add to that part because I was pretty excited about it. <laughs> yeah. Back to you. Thank you, yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, again, we're looking at how many community stakeholders were involved. So, I mean, it's pretty amazing to see just over on the right-hand side there that, yeah, over 7% have over 100 stakeholders involved in a single project. Um, and, and yeah, you can see that the range is high, you know, a, a significant number have between one and four participants per project. So again, depending on number of years, depending on body of research, there's a, there's a lot that we can, that we can look at here, but, but it might be really interesting for us to see, for example, the language used in projects that have over 100 participants compared to, to smaller numbers. Okay, and Zach is going to talk about the impacts of COVID-19. So this was a, a specific set of questions that we asked in the survey. Yeah, we were excited to share this part with you and we're still learning more. So um, the first thing, well, we, we, we wanted to ask them uh, what has been the impact, but then we realized, oh, there could be a positive impact or a negative impact or no impact. So first we asked them um, participants has the pandemic had an impact or no impact on community stakeholder participation in your study? So 44.4% said impacted. Now I need to tell you, because some of you might be saying that seems low, the not impacted includes everyone else. So that could be people who were not impacted, but also people who, uh, whose research projects were no longer happening. 
And this is partly because we did not include a not applicable on this uh, as a response option. So we're currently going through the not impacted and looking at the dates the projects were funded to sort that into two different groups. One will be not impacted and study was ongoing and the other will be not impacted project complete. So that was something that uh, some feedback that we got early on uh, that was very helpful. So I just wanted to explain that to you. So let's focus though on the group that was impacted. We then asked them about um, whether the impact was mostly positive, equally positive and negative or mostly negative. And you see that um, very few said mostly positive. We have about a quarter that said equally positive and negative, but the, the bulk of the respondents said that the impact of COVID had been mostly negative. So then we were curious about what type of impacts. Now, keep in mind, it is a survey. So, and we were trying to be conscious of people's time. So we didn't ask them tons of questions about this, but we did ask them about um, the impact in terms of community stakeholders access to monetary compensation, access to non-monetary compensation. So things like uh, services, social support, training, um, professional development, and then the third impact related to opportunities for community stakeholders to continue with the project at all. So in terms of the responses, we see that the biggest impact was on people's ability um, to continue with the project. Um, so almost 75% had an impact there. Then there were also about half of the people said there was an impact on the non-monetary aspects of the work. And then almost 20% um, in terms of monetary compensation. And then we look at, okay, was the impact positive or negative? Um, so the arrows going down is negative impact. So we see a high um, negative impact in terms of opportunity to continue with the project. 88% of the people who were, um, were negatively impacted by that. Um, and this is again, from a researcher perspective, access to non-monetary compensation, the challenges there in terms of people being able to connect, get training and other forms of, of support and engagement and, and also in terms of monetary compensation. There were though some people who were positively impacted by the pandemic and I'm glad we asked this, although it did make the question more complicated to analyze, but uh, there have been, and I think you're probably aware of it, some people who have been able to positively benefit, maybe people who are more easily um, either they had already been working online or they were more easily able to quote unquote pivot to an online uh, work environment. Um, and some people were still working face to face, but they had a huge demand on their work. I know that that's happened in a number of harm reduction um, research projects. There's just been a huge demand. And so um, this is obviously we need to look at both aspects of this and, and not forget that there's people kind of in both groups, although the people who have been positively impacted may be a smaller group. So um, of course we are really interested to know what does this mean? So I'm, um, in, in my career to date, I've tended to be more in the, you know, scoping reviews, qualitative side of things. So I'm really fascinated by this survey results, but definitely we want to know, yeah, but what does it actually mean? And what is the experience of this for people with, uh, you know, who are actually, you know, having an impact on their material circumstances. So we were able to get um, a partnership engagement grant from Shirk um, working with the Pacific AIDS Network. And so we proposed to do a small qualitative study looking at the impact of COVID on peer researchers living with HIV. Um, so we're planning in winter to conduct a series of focus, small focus groups um, with peers coming from uh, a number of regions of the country. And we wanna talk about what's been the effect of COVID-19 pandemic on income, social isolation, mental health and HIV treatment um, in relation to being a peer worker um, and to identify recommendations to how to minimize the impact of, of the pandemic going forward um, in terms of work interruptions. And I mean, informally, we've, we've certainly heard things about people you know, who, who lost their job overnight 
because if the universities were told that they had to stop in-person research and that was the only option at the time um, in terms of ethics approvals, some people, yeah, their, their work was um, eliminated. And, and so that was a, a shock, I think, on multiple levels for people. Um, and I, I, we definitely, I think, need to talk about what happens. I've also heard good examples of researchers who were able to um, continue to engage people as employees um, and, and adapt. But it's uh, from what we're understanding, there's quite a, a variety of things that have happened. Um, and so once we have those recommendations, we want to share them uh, both with community members, but also with academic HIV community based researchers. Uh, just to say, okay, this is what people are hoping for. Should this happen again? Is this realistic? What's possible? And how can we best go forward together, especially when we're thinking about people who are really facing precarious employment situations? Um, and so that's what we have in mind next, apart from, of course, continuing to analyze the, the data set that we have. I wanted to make sure to highlight our amazing team. So on the left, you have our uh, co-investigators and community collaborators. It's an amazing group of 18 from across Canada and also includes um, a number of our Indigenous partners. And we do have an Indigenous specific data set I wanted to mention within SHIFT. And we had um, a student who is Métis and who has been specifically working on that aspect of the screening and um, the data analysis, along with a group of our investigators who also do Indigenous community-based research. So that's something we have coming as well, but I didn't want to present it today, but that's something to look forward to. We currently have three um, research assistants working with the project, but you see also a very long list of folks from the past because screening all of those um, references the I don't know, I think it's something like 30,000 that we screened. I uh, took a huge amount of time. And so I'm very grateful to those folks. And that also leads me to being thankful for the funding that we have received, um, which has uh, been from the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council so far, a seed grant from the McGill Observatory on Health and Social Service Research, Social Science Research, and, and from the Center for Research on Children and Families. They're funding a piece of the COVID work that we're, that we're about to start the qualitative COVID piece. So really excited to um, hear what you think of this and any questions you have. And also if there's anything you really want to see first out of the data after this, you know, where you, where you would like us to focus our analysis. So I will, um, I've got a slide, it says Q and A. So I think, um, Sarah, I think I'm coming back to you now. Thank you so much, Zach. Uh, let me, I'm going to add myself to the screen so I'm not just a, a talking uh, head. <laughs> Should I just stop share? I don't need to share the slides anymore. Huh? Sure. There we go. That works. Okay, just a moment, everyone. I'm going to turn on my camera and there we go. Hi. <laughs> The Zoom world, right? Um, so uh, thank you so much, Zach and Veronica. That was that was such an interesting uh, presentation. One thing that, that uh, I'm, I'm left thinking about is just like the scope and magnitude of the project and looking across so many different participatory research projects across so many different fields, right? Um, and, and learning a little bit about how folks are engaging and, and most importantly compensating community partners and, um, and knowing that that looks a little bit different depending on the project. Uh, so we're gonna open it up for questions um, and it might take some time for folks to, to think about them. So um, I'll just kind of, I'll explain the process. So there is a Q and A uh, button option on the bottom of your screen. You can uh, open that up and type your questions into uh, the Q&A field. Uh, and if that doesn't work, if you're st stumbling around a little bit because technology can get the better of us sometimes, uh, feel free to put them into chat. You can either send them to everyone or hosts and panelists uh, and we'll sort that out. So give you a moment to think a little bit about any questions you might have for, for Zach and Veronica. And in the meantime, um, I've got um, 
I've got two questions uh, to, to start us off with. Um, I'm curious, Zach, especially for some of the folks that may have joined us a little bit later and, and didn't hear the, the preamble, can you speak a little bit um, about um, the, the kind of so what of the project and, 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 and the impetus or the goals behind bringing such um, broad different kind of participatory sectors together into, in, into a project and maybe to reiterate what those different kind of groups were for folks. Mm. Oh, that, that's always the hard question, isn't it? The so wet question, but let, let, let me give it a try and Veronica can jump in as well. Um, so for me, the so what is really about um, the experience of peer researchers, community scholars um, working in uh, participatory research and how we can improve um, their employment experiences because I think at this point we have a lot of data about um, the precarity that people face, um, the fact that people can feel quite isolated um, and at times not have a lot of support and um, I think as, as hard as we might try as um, academic researchers and, and community-based organizations as well, sometimes um, the, the conditions are not wonderful in terms of, you know, who gets hired, you know, do people have benefits? How do they get paid? I mean, I'm sure everyone knows people are, it's all over the map from people getting paid in gift cards, you know, uh, honoraria to being, you know, part-time staff, full-time staff with benefits, people who are self-employed. So it, it's, it's really diverse. And we didn't present all of that information to you today because I was worried about the time and I wanted to keep the focus on, on COVID, but um, those pieces are key. And over time, uh, I, you know, we've been talking about, is there an appetite for some worker co-ops, for some social enterprises? What could we do um, where we could be better supporting each other in this sector? And so people were not sort of like, always needing to be hired as individuals, but maybe could have um, more of a community uh, that they could rely on. And I know sometimes um, there's been pushback from, from researchers uh, in, in the institutions who say like, yeah, but, you know, what's gonna happen in terms of employment, uh, the, the pay rates, does that mean that we're gonna have to, you know, pay more or what are the implications gonna be? And, I, and I've also, you know, heard from peer researchers themselves that say, well, if academic researchers don't like this idea and they're the ones that hold the funds, then we could actually lose our employment. You know, so we have to be careful, you know, how we approach this. So there's definitely a lot of dynamics involved, but for me, it's really about um, peer researchers and community, uh, re other community stakeholders involved in research feeling um, more supported as employees um, in, in this process. And, and I think if I were to add anything to that, it's also that by way of doing the survey and having a representative random sample, you know, we're able to understand a little bit about what this sector is. And, you know, are there practices having over here that would be beneficial over here? Or is there insight from, from sort of this group of people doing a specific type of research in a specific type of university with a specific type of funding that that would be really helpful for us to learn about over here. Um, also, just even sort of like, uh, who, who should we talk to? Who are our colleagues? Who, you know, what's, what's happening down the street that, that we didn't know about? And I think that that goes back a little bit to this idea of, wait a minute, who do we even send the survey to? Um, and so, you know, I, I don't know if we emphasized enough how much developing that list uh, was, was a huge, exciting part of, of this work to just, to just even know sort of how many participatory researches are, are, are happening in, in Canada. And, and the thing about finding out, so, okay, we think your project is participatory based on what, how we read your description do you endorse that description? You know, so, so finding a little bit about how, how we recognize each other in the environment I is I think really important. That is such a great point, Veronica, because there's also ones that we didn't think were participatory that are. 
So that's another piece that we need to look at that I'm so fascinated by. And um, we've been talking as well to some folks that do like corpus linguistics and linguistics analysis who might be able to help us with that because it's pretty fascinating. But two other things to come back to are about why, why look at all these different sectors. I think we can be very siloed you know, with, within community-based research, we, ha we have a long history, it feels like, and in CBPR, and then there's, there's been a lot of funding and support in the patient-oriented research world, but we don't necessarily talk a lot. Um, and so we, I think we could be advancing better and have a stronger community of practice if we were talking kind of like across those practices as opposed to each trying to build a new sort of like body of work when and I know I've definitely heard folks ex express frustration about that and said yeah we've been doing that already for 15 years like why do they think that's a new thing you know so that piece about being able to talk across different and across different contexts I think is exciting the other thing I don't know if we mentioned is that we really want to talk to the academic researchers as well and we did ask if people would be willing to be interviewed. And of the 1,005, um, 300 people said they would like to be interviewed about their research. But to me, this is amazing. We, were put, we put down 30 to 40. <laughs> so all of a sudden, we have 300 people that would like to be interviewed. We have no money for that, so we're currently uh, figuring out how we can get that that part of the project funded. Not that we would necessarily talk to 300, but I think we might um, look at types of research, um, uh, which funding, like which funding body they may be from, um, and then decide from there, like to have a, a, a few different samples of people that we could talk to. Um, so yeah, I don't know, Sarah, if that answers your question. Thank you so much, Zach and Veronica. And we have a few questions from our audience, which is great. Um, uh, in the interest of time, I'm gonna I'm gonna collapse both of them because I think that they're 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 similar. Um, so uh, thank you, Amanda and Alexandra, for sending in these questions. Uh, so Alexandra asked, "What was the biggest surprise to you both when looking at your results?" Which Zach, you started speaking to a little bit. And Amanda asked, um, "I think a lot about ethics and participatory research. What would be your ethical takeaway from this research? Did you find some sectors reluctant to engage?" Um, and uh, if you can say a little bit more about future directions. Uh, and I think it might also be helpful just for folks that have joined late, just to remind us that, you know, because there was such breadth of sectors in terms of uh, community-based participatory research, Indigenous-led research, citizen science, et cetera. What was that, what was that breadth in terms of the different fields? Got it. Do you want to answer that one, Veronica? Or do you want me to do it? Okay, I'll go ahead. Okay, so the breadth was, in our minds, we conceptualized it as um, CBR, CBPR, Indigenous CBR, citizen science, patient-oriented research, and um, I'm forgetting one. <laughs> Uh, I'm forgetting one. There was basically four. Oh, no, maybe I've got them all. So yeah, so there was basically four in our minds, but we didn't approach it that way. Instead, we just went to who's been funded. Um, and then, especially with the random sample, which was 1,380 from each of the agencies, uh, we just asked them, are you doing participatory research? And we gave them a definition, which was as broad as we mentioned to you. Basically, did you involve stakeholders from outside of academia? And that could be anything from community members, clinicians, politicians, um, other forms of community leaders. So really broad. Um, and I definitely would say sometimes when we looked at the summaries, we would say, well, this isn't community-based research, but with the with a definition that's so broad, we said, okay, well, maybe it is. Maybe it's at least participatory in some way. But we didn't ask people, Sarah, what they called themselves, which is an interesting question. Okay, can you remind us? of the two things you put out there now that I've talked about that. <laughs> Absolutely. So we've, we've collapsed two of the questions and we have one more question after this, if we have time, we'll, we'll see. Um, so the first question was, what was the biggest surprise when looking at your results? Um, and then the second question uh, was kind of your ethical takeaways from the, the research. Um, and if you, if you found that, you know, perhaps some 
participatory research sectors were more likely to engage uh, than others. And, and what, are, what are next steps? Okay, Veronica, do you wanna answer any of them? Yeah, I, I think I can just start by saying, I think that we are in store for a number of surprises. Um, we are, despite trying to ask few really pointed questions, we have a ton of data. And so we are really excited to look at it, but um, but off the, off the bat, I would say that the engagement in the survey was really refreshingly surprising. Um, we, one of the things we found is that people really want to talk about it. Um, and so, and so, so I think we're seeing that there's like a hunger to, to be involved with it. We, people were emailing us, people were really, really engaging with the process. Um, it, it was really amazing that 300 people said, yeah, I would like to spend an hour of my time talking to you about this. <laughs> I, I think my biggest surprise was actually probably the answer related data. So from the natural sciences and engineering, when we went through over 3,000 of those summaries, we identified six, six out of 3,000 that we thought were participatory. And then when we also included an indigenous lens, which was whether the research was being done in relation to indigenous communities, that number went up to, I think it was 39. So it was a really small number, right? Um, and that one of the reasons we didn't do more than 10% was because it was so low. But from the random sample, we have 337 people. So almost 24% of the people who responded to the NSERC random sample said that they are doing some form of participatory research. So I found that really intriguing. Um, and I think it could be that we didn't know what to look for. You know, maybe it's also the other thing is people might, might not be writing about it in those little summaries. So there's all these pieces, right? Just you, you have like a 250 word summary. You may or may not have it in there. So for me, that was, um, I'd say probably the biggest surprise. Yeah. And ethical takeaways. Ooh. Do you have anything, Veronica? I mean, I think that that is something that's going to become more and more of a question as we start to do more data analysis. I think that, um, yeah, I don't know. I feel like that's a really, that's a, that's a pretty complex thing to, to come up with. That is, yeah, maybe a little premature, I don't know. Yeah, we, you're right. We might not be there. We might not be there yet. I, I mean, I have a feeling once we get into the details about um, the remuneration and the employment labor context specifically, for me, that also relates to ethics. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's kind of funny because I am obsessed with ethics. Um, for me, it might actually be more about uh, researching researchers. Um, this is one of the first times I've done something like this. And it's so it's sometimes we call it researching up. I don't know if I consider those the respondents my peers, you know what I mean, as an academic researcher. Maybe they are, maybe they're not. Academia is quite hierarchical. So um, that piece is really different. And um, I felt, yes, there are definitely some uh, tensions and dynamics to be explored through that for anyone else that's uh, researched researchers before. I, I just also wanted to go back to surprises. Um, so in the terms of like, how would you, uh, how do you refer to the community stakeholders involved in your, in your um, project? I, I don't think I emphasized when we went through the slide that we had over a hundred submissions for other. Um, that didn't necessarily match. So, so that's telling us something about, about the language used, which goes back to our screening process and how, yeah, there might have been keys in the description that we, that we missed because people are using language that we weren't familiar with, even though we had a huge team. And in terms of the, thanks Veronica, in terms of next steps, I think the, the data right now is really descriptive, you know, just kind of a, a first pass through to give you an overview. But once we get into being able to, we can obviously look at the demographics of the researchers, 
So if they were early career or mid career type of thing, small universities, large, that kind of thing, what type of funding stream they're in, even what type of subject area. But then as we were going through this preparing for today, I realized, oh, we could compare the people who said um, they use the word citizen science uh, or the people that use the word say they work with patients with people who say they work with community organizations. So we can run analysis that allows us to compare those groups on different things. So when we get to something like, I mean, obviously today we were talking about COVID, so we could say, okay, how um, were people that work with patients more impacted in terms of like, did they see more negative impacts than people who work with like policymakers? This is an interesting question. I have no idea if we would find any significant differences there, um, uh, in addition to be able to look at like subject areas. So there is ways that we will be able to look at some differences within the data set. And um, as I mentioned, we also have an Indigenous specific data set that, that I'm really excited to work with our partners to, to analyze and see, see what we have there. Yeah. Thank you so much, Zach and Veronica. Um, we are almost at time. We have a few things to kind of wrap up, um, but I just want to acknowledge there was two other questions that we um, uh, questions and a comment that um, just to, to just to say thank you and 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 perhaps to open it up for conversation next time because we are going to have uh, an event on uh, the 18th. Uh, so Amy asked or, or commented, thank you so much for sharing this project with us. Amazing. Uh, and asked a little bit about talking about next steps with interviews. And I know Zach and Veronica, you, you spoke to that. So um, hopefully uh, you answered some of that question. And uh, Dr. Sean Haynes um, uh, said an eagle feather with the flight of a bald eagle can assist with the validation of ethics while maintaining the production of the study. So thank you so much to, to both of you for sending in those, those questions. I'm gonna share my screen very shortly um, just to, to talk to everyone about next steps. Okay, hopefully folks can see this all right. There we go. So for those of you who are joining us for the very first time, one of the things that we always do with these webinars is we always follow up with a live discussion. These live discussions are so engaging. They are led by all of you. Um, you don't have to have attended this webinar in order to participate. We always do a short recap, um, but it'll be facilitated by um, Zach and Veronica. So we encourage you to come out. And I'm gonna ask Jesse to uh, pop the link into chat for us um, so that you can register. Uh, Jesse did that. Thank you so much, Jesse. So please come out. Uh, uh, it's a, a really great event and it really allows us to also talk about these issues. So um, a lot of it's in breakout groups um, and structured by conversations around these very topics around uh, labor, you know, we talking more about labor um, issues and ethics and how do we do this work in a, in a good way and, and what does it mean to have researchers study research to reflect on our practice or what does it mean to look so broadly across participatory research so all of these conversations we'll be talking about then and 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 the the conversation will be very much led by you so you can bring your own questions and discussion points there uh, and then in december we have another upcoming webinar and live discussion called closing the opportunity gap uh, for racialized and under-resourced communities through the community school initiative uh, and uh, jesse has popped um, the link uh, for all of our events so you can find that event uh, there. And that's led by uh, Dr. Artaban Arjadad uh, at Laurier and some folks uh, in Toronto as well. Uh, and that will be a really, really fabulous uh, webinar and live discussion. So um, I'd also like to encourage us to uh, reflect on on this session. Tell us what you think. Um, we're going to post another link to the chat um, with a, a survey that you can fill out. Um, and in the meantime, thank you. Thank you everyone so much uh, for, for coming out um, and uh, sharing your questions and, and being with us today um, on a Thursday. Uh, thank you so, so very much. I'm gonna end my screen here. Oh, and one more thing to highlight here is that all the webinar recordings are shared online. So we'll send that link out to everyone uh, when it's done. So 
thank you so much. Um, and we hope to see you on November 18th. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everybody.